Right. It's good that we can all be here this evening. We'll have a few songs before we have our Bible class for today. And the first song is song 749. Song 749, The Battle Belongs to the Lord. In heavenly armor we'll enter the land, the battle belongs to the Lord. No weapon that's fashioned against us will stand, the battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord, we sing glory. strength to the Lord. When the power of darkness comes in like a flood, the battle belongs to the Lord. He's raised up a standard, the power of his blood. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, strength to the Lord. When your enemy presses in heart, do not fear, the battle belongs to the Lord. Take courage, my friend, your redemption is dear, the battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. The next song is song 647. Song 647, Soldiers of Christ Arise. Soldiers of Christ, arise and put your armor on, strong in the strength which God supplies. Strong in the strength which God supplies through his beloved Son. Strong in the Lord of hosts and in his mighty power, who in the strength of Jesus trusts, who in the strength of Jesus trusts, is more than conqueror. Stand then in his great might, with all his strength and joy. But take to arm you for the fight. But take to arm you for the fight, the panoply of God. Leave no unguarded place, no weakness of the soul. Take every virtue, every grace. Take every virtue, every grace, and fortify the whole. That having all things done, and all your conflicts past, you may all come through Christ alone. You may all come through Christ alone and stand entire at last. And we'll have one more song before we have the opening prayer and Bible class for the day, and that's song 678. Song number 678, more about Jesus. Yes, 
More about Jesus would I know, more of his grace to others show, more of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. More, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. More about Jesus, let me learn, more of his holy will, dear Son, Spirit of God, my teacher be, showing the things of Christ to me. More, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. More about Jesus in his word, holding communion with my Lord, hearing his voice in every line, making each faithful saying mine. More, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. More about Jesus on his throne, riches in glory all his own. More of his kingdom sure increase, more of his coming Prince of Peace. More, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. Let's bow and pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this day you've blessed us with. We thank you that we can have this time where we can assemble together freely to be able to uh, sing songs of praise to you, to pray to you, and also to uh, hear a lesson from your word and to learn um, from the book of Matthew and to examine what it has to say and to improve our knowledge of your word and to consider the lessons and principles that we can learn from uh, this great book and um, see how we can apply them to our lives to ensure that we are always living as you would have us to. I ask that you'll please uh, be with uh, um, the members of the congregation that are not able to be with us this evening for whatever reason, pray that you'll look after them and strengthen them and that we may, oh, we pray that we may be able to uh, see them soon. Also pray that um, you'll be with uh, the leaders of this land, that uh, they will make decisions that are in accordance with your will and that we may always be able to live our lives uh, in a quiet and peaceful manner as you would have us to, uh, free from uh, any conflicts and uh, issues there. I ask that you'll please um, be with us now. Pray that we'll be attentive to the things that are taught, and we pray these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> All righty. Good evening, church. Good evening, church. Oh, for those online, there are some people, yeah. Um, so I had a few comments uh, at the end of last um, lesson, or just, what about the birth of Christ? Why is it not in 0 BC? Why is it not, um, you know, 180? And um, so I did a bit of research into it, and I've actually got quite a long lesson tonight because I'm wanting to get through chapter 3 of Matthew. So I'm going to give you the summarized version. If anybody wants all these notes, you're more than welcome to them. Um, the short version is that at this particular time, there are three different dating systems going on, three different calendars. Um, and that's what he's saying. So you can read these by yourself um, if you can speed read while listening to me or if you wish to tune me out and read, that's all right as well. But pretty much Rome was founded in around 759 um, what we would say 759 BC, ironically, coincidentally, on April the 1st, April Fool's Day, I don't know. Um, 
And on that uh, particular year, the Roman calendar came into effect. And uh, at about 46 AD, um, and so the reason the Roman calendar came into effect was because the Romans wanted to bring structure and, and political framework to everything, including the dating system. And so they based their calendar, obviously, from the beginning of Rome. And that is always abbreviated with the date with AUC at the end. Um, in about 46 A, what we would call 46 AD, uh, Julius Caesar wanted a more structured calendar that was a little bit more accurate because by this time they noticed that they were losing the leap year. And so the moons and the seasons were coming out of whack with the calendar. And so Julius Caesar got his best mathematicians together to put together a calendar which included the leap year. Um, and then uh, about 50 or so years later, the same Julius Caesar forced Rome to become an imperial uh, structure. Um, and then he then decreed that all the dating thereafter would then be actually dated according to the rise of the latest Roman emperor. And so you had the original Roman calendar giving dates, then you had the Julian calendar providing dates, and then you had the dates being given by the Roman emperor of the time. So three different calendars. And in about 1278 AUC, which equates to about 525 AD, um, a mathematically minded monk by the name of Dionysius Exegius invented the concept of AD. And he was a very, he was a monk, he was very religious, and he wanted the calendar year to start off when Christ was born. Um, he was a little bit biased though. So one is, I'm going to actually just read this bit. Uh, so <clears throat> I'm going to kick off from about, as indicated above, the man's concern was to make more accurate predictions going, predictions going forward of when Easter should be celebrated annually. And to him, Christian time ought to dominate the Romulus and Remus time. So he counted backward 525 years from the year he was making his calculations to the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ, or to the what's now known as in the year of the Lord in Latin, A.D. and I Domini. Scholars find it difficult to understand how Dionysius picked 525 years for his calculation. And from what I've read, it's too long and complicated for space here to contain but here's what the charming humanity and the flexibility of the process is discernible. Dionysus specified that he wanted to avoid any clues that included emperors who persecuted Christians. And he also, there was also at the time a pervading idea that Christ was going to come exactly 500 years after his birth. And so what this guy did was he thought 500 years after Christ's birth, I'll just chuck on an extra 25 years and I'll set this date as AD 25 or yeah, AD 525 because that way there won't be any panic. No one's going to worry about Christ coming because it's already over 500 years past his birth. And hence we have the Gregorian calendar, which doesn't quite line up with exactly when Jesus was born. So hence we talk about Herod. We know that Herod, based on the three calendars and dating systems that there were at the time and how they relate to what's now known as a Gregorian calendar, which also actually was only finally accepted globally in about 800 BC and in some parts of the world was only accepted in about 1600 BC. So um, the Julian calendar was really used for very many years before the Gregorian calendar became the calendar and the time-keeping piece that we know it today. In fact, I can't remember what the date is. In the 1800s somewhere, there is a window. There is a window where, from October 5th to October 15th, the the calendar went from October 5th to October 15th. There is no anyone even who was born in that window. All those birthdays were just dated to October 15th, and that was to align because by this time the Julian calendar, which was 88, 88 300s or something like that out in its calculating of the leap year. So there you go. Interesting information. How we came to Christ's actual year of birth not being exactly well known. He goes on to talk about, so there's a few, um, a few ways to work out when Christ was born. And pretty much uh, you could argue um, any time between 6 BC to 2 AD. 
uh, based on a few things, which he's got listed there, which I'm not going to go through. Um, and this guy did a lot of research on it. And um, so full credit to him for all of that information. And what is the last thing I was going to say? Oh, that's right. Um, I personally don't believe Christ could have been born any time after uh, 2 BC because obviously we know that Herod died between 4 and 1 BC and he was directly involved with Jesus' birth. So the 1, or the, the 1 and 2 BC come in because of Luke's account uh, or the talking about Jesus being 30 years old when he began his ministry and, and one or two things that Luke references. If you go back from that you get to about 2 AD. But none of that is exact. It all says about, so there's no real documentation of any of those things. Anyways, Matthew chapter 3. Welcome to the Bible study. Um, so some Q&A. Uh, what is the opening phrase of Matthew? Direct translation. Mm, close. All right, the book of the Genesis of Jesus Christ. Yep. Okay, book of the Genesis of Jesus Christ. How many wise men or magi were there? We don't know. Trick question. Very good. Didn't catch you guys out on that one. Uh, roughly, what year was Jesus born? Oh, I just gave you the answer to that. Why is Matthew the first of the four Gospels? written first tradition good alrighty so now that hopefully we're a bit more awake after the boring history lesson uh, let's look at Matthew chapter 3 so we're going to read the first six verses together in those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand for this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah saying the voice of one crying in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord make his path straight <coughs> Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem, all Judea and all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. So verse 1 and 2, in those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In those days, so John is about six months older than than Jesus. If you didn't know that, you can see that in Luke chapter 1, verse 23 through 26, when Mary goes and visits her cousin or her kinswoman, uh, Elizabeth. And so John is about six months older than Jesus. So obviously Jesus is around. So in those days, we know that Jesus is coming soon after. Uh, John was the first prophet after Malachi. Just take a minute to think about that. It's quite interesting. John is the first prophet after Malachi. Malachi points most directly to John. And that makes sense when you consider the fact that John was the first prophet after Malachi. So in Malachi chapter 3 verses 1, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. All right, and we see that John there was preaching, or, or yeah, preaching in the wilderness. Okay, so consider the parallel of the Israelites under Moses. All right, they traveled 40 years in the wilderness before they came to the promised land. Uh, John was in the wilderness. Moses crossed the river Jordan to get into the promised land. John was on the other side of the Jordan. Um, so just a quick look of roughly. So that's the Jordan River. Uh, that's Jerusalem, just to get your bearing. So Jesus was up in Galilee, if you remember, and John is preaching uh, over there in Bethany on the other side of the Jordan. So people had crossed the Jordan to get back into the promised land. Um, and nations feared the Israelites crossing. So if you remember, after they took down Jericho, really, and we read continually throughout the uh, coming in of the Israelites into the promised land, um, that the nation's hearts were melting with fear. And we, see, we saw in chapter 2, verse 3 of Matthew, that all were troubled at the coming of Christ. So we see a real parallel here as the nation Israel was established and also as the New Testament is about to be, New Testament teaching is about to be established in Jesus Christ. 
Uh, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, uh, Matt, uh, John says. When he says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So if you turn with me to Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, just to, um, for those of you who may not be familiar with that term, at hand. Um, oh, I can't find, oh, that's why I can't find Daniel. In the wrong place. Ezekiel, Daniel. So in Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, Daniel sees his vision, or the, sorry, Nebuchadnezzar sees his vision and Daniel interprets it. And in, uh, oh, sorry, I'm in chapter 4, my bad. Uh, so Daniel, yes, it is, yeah. Daniel's interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And he says, And in these days the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms it shall stand forever so that's referring to the kingdom that we're actually reading about in matthew and then if we flip over in daniel to chapter 8 and verse 26 we see daniel is told and this vision of evenings and mornings which is told is true therefore seal up the vision for it refers to many days in the future so we see that Daniel's vision was he was to seal it up. It was going to happen a long time away. But in Matthew chapter 2, verse 3, we see that it's at hand. And in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, we read uh, from that time on, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I'm not going to read uh, the Mark passage, but that's another um, one where we see it being used. But I would like to jump to Revelation. Chapter 22 and verse 10, where Jesus speaking or in, uh, uh, showing John his message says that he said to me, do not, or the angel uh, conveying Jesus' message, do not seal the words of this prophecy for the time is at hand. So in Daniel, seal up the words of the prophecy. It's going to happen a long time away. But throughout the New Testament, we see that the time is at hand it's upon us the last days are upon us and in verse 3 we read that uh, this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah saying the voice of one crying out in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord make his paths straight um, and that's a direct quote from Isaiah chapter 40 verses 1 through 5 um, and this passage was a passage to comfort the people so if you'd like to go there quick I want to just read it so that you can understand um, the message the people would have got when John is preaching about this. Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So when John is preaching this message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew says that he was completing what was spoken about by Isaiah and anyone and especially the Jews reading this book would have felt comforted by that. Because they would have recognized that this was the prophecy of the Messiah that was to bring that comfort to pardon their iniquity. It is a passage showing the mercy of God. And it was a passage showing a way made for the king. Right? So kings, uh, when they went or went, traveled along the highway, they would send construction workers before them to make sure that the road was as smooth as possible for their trip. Because... They were beyond just using normal means of transport. So it was a passage showing that a way and a path was getting made ready for a king. So we read in verse 4, John the baptizer. Um, now John himself was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his weight and was clothed in... Uh, sorry, and, sorry, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Um, John in a way, is the star that the wise men saw. So the star led the wise men to Jesus. Uh, John wasn't quite an actual star or the star that they saw, but John, in the same way, in this chapter, is leading people to Christ. 
He was the star that was hopefully going to lead Israel to see Jesus as the Son of God. And he was wearing clothing of camel's hair and a leather belt. And we know that John is prophesied to be the Elijah that was to come. Jesus himself says that is recorded in Matthew 17, verse 12 through 13. Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has come already. And they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. And in verse 13, the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. Um, and in 2 Kings chapter 1 and verse 8, So they answered him, a hairy man wearing a leather belt around his waist. And he said, it is Elisha, the, Elijah the Tishbite. So just showing the relation there between what John uh, was wearing compared to how Elijah was known. Right, eating locusts and wild honey, common food, especially for the poor people. We see in Leviticus chapter 11, verse 20 through 23, that they, uh, the people were, were allowed to eat locusts and they were very commonly found in the desert as well as the honey. This is not the nice processed honey that we buy from Woolworths. It would have just been, um, they call it wild honey, it's sometimes translated as. So just honey off, um, caked onto the rocks, almost like a sweet nectar, almost, rather than the honey that we're thinking of from bees. Verse 5 through 6, Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. So Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region. So John's message, his presence was very well known. It was a very public ministry. Um, and he called the people to come baptizing and, and to, to be baptized and to confess their sins. And remember that at this stage, Romans 6 wasn't even a flicker in anyone's imagination. No one... I mean, Jesus hadn't even been introduced at this stage. So this baptism really was, first of all, all the commentators acknowledge that this baptism was baptism by immersion. And it was a custom, uh, it was a customary spiritual cleansing type of ritual for the Jews. And that's according to Annie Nathan Mayer, who is a Jew that wrote a lot of um, works in uh, sort of the late 19th century, as you can see there. And um, she said that this was a, a very popular custom in her um, studies that the Jews went through. Um, to acknowledge a fact public, publicly, so that confessing or that confession, the way that that's written would indicate that this was a kind of a stated public type of confession. It's not each person had their own little mini confession. It was something that was stated publicly you know, they've, I've sinned and I need this baptism to repent. Or I want to, you know, so that kind of a, that kind of a confession. So likened to today, you know, we, we normally traditionally would ask someone before they're baptized, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he died for your sins? And yes, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he died for my sins. That sort of public uh, confession. With, with a sense of formality. All right, so the Pharisees and the Sadducees come in verse 7. And um, for those of you who may not be aware, there were pretty much three real sects that interacted with Jesus. There were the Essenes at the top and then the Pharisees and the Sadducees at the bottom. The Pharisees were a lay Jewish party that exercised strict piety according to the Mosaic and Oral Law, uh, whereas the Sadducees were a part uh, of that aristocracy connected to the temple and priesthood, uh, more of the liberal kind of uh, sect, if you will. So the Pharisees were very traditional, uh, very pi uh, pious, and stuck to anything that they wrote into or the law, um, whereas the, Phar the Sadducees more, you know, more believed in spirits and angels communicating with the people and, and were very open uh, to interpret things uh, loosely. And John calls them brood of vipers, all right? Um, that would have been obviously a very cutting insult and possibly evoked the image of the serpent in Eden. Um, and he says to them, who warned you? And of course, this statement is really, if, if you didn't pick it up, it, it took me um, reading through a few commentaries to really pick up the irony intended in this. 
Who warned you? Because think about who he's speaking to. He's speaking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, people that considered themselves very religious, the Pharisees, very pious, very um, strictly living in strict accordance with their traditions, the Sadducees connected with the high priest, the, the priesthood, the temple works, etc. And he says to them, who warned you? Like, what do you mean who warned us? No one needs to warn us of anything. We're, we know what we're doing. But he says, who warned you? It insinuated that they needed to be warned. What do, you, what do you mean, who warned us? We don't need to be warned about anything. It also insinuated that they were the most, uh, that they needed most the repentance and the baptism. Who warned you to flee the coming wrath? In other words, there's a wrath that's coming and you definitely need to be warned about it. So there was a lot of insinuation um, in that uh, sentence, in that remark to them. So if we look at if we look at verse eight of chapter three, um, he says to them that they were to bear fruit worthy of repentance. So repentance is only repentance as fruit is born. In Matthew chapter seven, verse seventeen, Jesus, his Sermon on the Mount, mentions that uh, it is quite simple to see who's doing the right thing because of the fruit that they're bearing. Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. All right, and really this verse sets up for verse 8, oh, sorry, verse 10, where it talks about the axe coming to the tree. Oh, I didn't actually read these verses. Sorry, I was supposed to do that. Um, so in verse 7 through 12 is what we're looking at now. When he saw the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath of come? Wrath to come. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not think to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. All right, so now that we've read that, uh, this idea of repentance is only repentance if fruit is born, and the idea that you need to be bearing fruit as a tree, as a, a, tr a good tree, and it sets it up for verse 10, which talks about the axe is laid to the root of those trees that do not bear fruit. So verse 10, Abraham, if we look at Matthew chapter 8 and verse 10 through 12. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and he said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of trees uh, of teeth sorry so in verse 8 uh, or in verse 9 where he says um, do not say that you have Abraham as your father uh, he's saying and Jesus is echoing that thought that Abraham is not what's going to save you being related or being of a physical relationship to Abraham is not what's going to save you because God can one God can do anything and two it is the new um, the new covenant and the new works that will save you. So if we read Ezekiel chapter 37, 3 through 10, um, is really also the vision that would have been invoked in their minds. And I say, and say, thus says the Lord, be, oh, sorry, that's the wrong chapter. Let's try chapter 37. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? And so I answered, O Lord, God, you know. And he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with the skin and put breath in you and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling and the bones came together bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. Also he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. 
So I, promised, so I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood up on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Now, while that passage alone is one that evokes incredible image, um, really that's what John's referring to here, is that Jesus can and would and uh, do anything, and more importantly than that, this was a new covenant where the soul that sins is the soul that will die. And of course, that's also in Ezekiel, in uh, Ezekiel chapter 18. I'm not going to read all of it, but I am going to read uh, Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 22 and 23, which just pretty much sums up what I've said. None of the transgressions which he has committed shall be remembered against him because of the righteousness which he has done, he shall live. Do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord? and not that he should turn from his ways and live. So really, John is saying the same thing here. Turn from your ways and live. You have the opportunity to turn and be alive again. Um, so in verse 10, he echoes this thought of bearing good fruit. All right, Not just any fruit. They had to bear good fruit. And now the axe is laid to the root of the tree. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down. And of course, in Matthew, sorry, in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 23, we get two very distinct lists of fruit. We get the fruit that will ultimately lead to eternal damnation in a lake of fire. And then in verses 22 and 23, obviously the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and faithfulness and self-control. We need to be bearing these fruit if we want eternal life, because against these there is no law and they will lead to eternal life. We've looked at Matthew chapter 7, verse 17 already. All right, into the fire. So that do, they that do not bear good fruit will be cast into the fire. So Matthew chapter 13 is one account of that. I'm just going to jump straight to the Revelation reading in Revelation chapter 20. Verse 10 through 15, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it from those, sorry, and, the, and he who sat, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So this is leading into... The verse 12 of this particular passage that John is, um, or this particular speech that John is giving, um, or sermon or lesson that he's giving. So we saw the fruit in 8 relating to chapter, verse 10. We see here the fruit and the fire ultimately is going to be tied off in verse 12 of this passage. So in verse 11, uh, John talks about Jesus, introduces Jesus and how he sits in relation to Jesus. And he says there that I am not worthy to carry the sandals or to loose the sandals of Jesus' feet, which was obviously the lowest of the lowest servant would be asked to carry out this task. And, and John says that he is not even worthy of being that lowest servant for Jesus Christ who was to come. And I like the way uh, Matthew Henry put it. He says, see how meanly he speaks of himself that he might magnify Christ. I indeed baptize you with water that is the utmost that I can do, he says. But he that comes after me is mightier than I. Though John came in the spirit and power of Elias, which is the old English way of saying Elijah, Christ has more. Though John was truly great, great in the sight of the Lord, not a greater was born of woman, yet he thinks himself unworthy to be the meanest place of attendance upon Christ. In other words, the lowest of lows. He sees one how mighty Christ is in comparison with him, and note it is a great comfort to the faithful ministers to think that Jesus Christ is mightier than they can do that for them, 
and that by them which they cannot do, his strength is perfected in their weakness. So very much like Paul um, in his lesson to the Galatians. And the second thing he notes about John is he sees how mean he is in comparison with Christ. He's not worthy to carry his shoes after him. Note those whom God puts honor upon are thereby made very humble and low in their own eyes, willing to be abased so that Christ may be magnified. To be anything, to be nothing, so that Christ may be all. So a real encouragement um, and a real lesson from John's attitude and his humility before Jesus Christ. All right, so yeah, we're looking at John's statement. You know, I come to baptize you with water and he will come and baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So often misinterpreted verse, especially in the Pentecostal churches. Um, but just let's take a minute to consider the context of this verse. All right, so we have the fruit in verse 8. We have the tree in verse 10. And these both relate to the condition of the soul. The good fruit, good people. Bad fruit, bad people. Bad soul, etc. Verse 12 talks about the good and the bad. So we're going to look at that in just a minute. So verse 11 is introducing that thought when he says he will come and baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And in his hand is a winnowing fan. All right, so when I was looking for a winnowing fan, I saw this and I thought, I don't quite that think that was the fan. Can you see it? Not really. So that's an electric fan behind the guy. <laughs> so that's, that's not the fan Jesus was talking about. All right, so that's, that's, not a, that's not the winnowing fan of Jesus' day. Um, I just found that a bit amusing. So some translations say winnowing fork. That's what a winnowing fork looks like. A winnowing fan does the job a lot more manually than the electric fan. So that would often be there would be someone sitting behind the person threshing and they would be waving a board or a plank or a tree or tree leaves up and down so that there was this wind and then they would be sitting there with like a threshing tool um, popping it up so that the wind would blow the chaff away and the wheat would stay in, in the little basket. Or in that scenario over there, they'd take the fork and, and pop, the, pop, pop the grain up. And actually, you would have seen it in that video if you weren't trying so hard to see the fan that was really of a bad contrast. You struggled to see it. But they, they actually had these mats, so that's a type of mat on the side there. And again, just... The, th the chaff that doesn't go through, you see it's got holes, so when they finish, they just pick up that mat and they just give it a little bit of shake, and the chaff that would have settled just falls out the bottom, so you're left with just the good grain. And that's what Jesus is talking about here, or what John, sorry, John is talking about here, that Jesus will come and baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire, and his winnowing fan, or fork, is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Um, so we've read about the fire. Uh, thoroughly cleaned. So you saw uh, that sled that I was referring to, and, and again, I probably should have pointed it out when the YouTube video was playing. They're, they're on a black, massive big black mat, so when they're done, they'll clean that up so that they get all the good grain and get rid of all the chaff. Um, and John, uh, sorry, Jesus, when he judges, he will judge righteously. He will do a good job. He will do a full job, and he will thoroughly clean uh, the floor. John chapter five, verses thirty. I can of myself do nothing, as I hear I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. And then our memory verse, John chapter twelve, verse forty-eight. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. This verse is really a throwback right to the beginning of John's dialogue. His wheat into the barn. All right, so in, we go back to Matthew verse 8, which is where he started speaking to the Pharisees. And he says to them, therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. So this idea of bearing good fruit that he's collected and putting it into the barn. And um, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. 
who has also sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So the Holy Spirit is our seal and it is our guarantee. In Revelation chapter 7, verse 3, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And as you go throughout Revelation, you see that this is a distinct point where from here on out, the Christians are sealed and they are no longer affected by any of the punishments that God brings upon those who are trying to get to repent. Uh, Psalm 119 verse 160. The entirety of your word is truth. And every one of your righteous judgments endure forever. All right. So the Holy Spirit is upon those who are sealed by God. They are the wheat that is going into the barn. Whereas he will burn up the chaff. So we've read Matthew 13, 40 through 42. We've read Revelation 20, 10 through 15. This is the fire. So God is going to judge the world with his Holy Spirit and with fire. Those who are in the book of life, those who have received the seal, the guarantee, they will inherit eternal life. They will be gathered into the barn. They would be the good wheat. They have borne good fruit. But those who have not borne good fruit, they will be baptized with that fire. They will be burned up. They will not be kept. They will be in the eternal, unquenchable fire, as John puts it. Okay, the last third of chapter three then jesus came from galilee to john at the jordan to be baptized by him and john tried to prevent him saying i need to be baptized by you and are you coming to me but jesus answered and said to him permit it to be so now for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness then he allowed him when he had been baptized jesus came up immediately from the water and behold the heavens were opened to him and he saw the spirit of god descending like a dove and alighting upon him and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So verse 13, Galilee. So as I mentioned a little bit earlier, so this is the same map, just with some cool lines on it. Uh, so there's Nazareth. Jesus was in Galilee of Nazareth. And he went down to be baptized. Remember, John was baptizing at Bethany. So Jesus was baptized at Bethany. That green line, just out of curiosity, is what will probably be looked at ne next time because next week is the men's and ladies' classes. But next time we look at Matthew again, that's the probable route Jesus was taken into the wilderness to be tempted in Matthew chapter 4. And he came specifically to be baptized. And this is a specific marker in the life of Christ. If you go to Acts chapter 1 verse 21... Peter speaking, he says, therefore, when they're wanting to choose Judas's replacement, therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all the time that our Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to the day he was taken up from us. So this was a specific marker. This was the beginning of Christ's ministry. This was the beginning of his public work for God. It was a specific anointing of Christ and we see that in verse 16 that the Holy Spirit alights on him this was a specific proclamation of the Christ and we see that in in God speaking about his son saying this is my beloved son all right so this is a very important point that happens right here as Jesus is baptized and in verse 14 John tried to prevent him so that's written in the imperfect tense, so really it's just some translations may translate that as uh, John prevented him, uh, tried to prevent him, attempted to prevent him, any one of those. The reason is because in the imperfect tense, it means that there is no completion of the action identified or confirmed. So it's in the past, but there was no, there's, there's no visibility on that action having actually been done. So John tried to prevent Christ from being baptized but he, he didn't 
And Jesus basically commands him, speaks to him in the imperative voice and says to him, permit it to be so. John's baptism was one of repentance. Did Jesus need repenting? No, he didn't need repenting. So why was he baptized then? Well, he was baptized so that all righteousness would be fulfilled. He wasn't there to repent of his sins. He was there to fulfill all righteousness. Um, and so just a couple of quick questions surrounding baptism. Is baptism a work? So what, who wants to answer that question? Is baptism a work? Okay, some people are unsure. Okay, I see some nods of the head. Yes, baptism itself, it is a work. <laughs> Someone, something's happening, so it can't be nothing. All right? But who's doing the work? All right? The person baptizing, the baptizer, John the baptizer, baptized Jesus. Jesus didn't baptize Jesus. Jesus was baptized. He was the one upon whom the work was done, not for his repentance, but to fulfill all righteousness, to show that Jesus submitted himself to that which was right. Both are needed to complete the baptism. You need a baptizer and you need someone to be baptized. And so Jesus is baptized by John to fulfill all righteousness. And in verse 16, um, this has always been something that's interested me or intrigues me is probably a better way to put that. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water and behold, I like the fact or it, it intrigues me, it excites me, it it fills me with, uh, with fullness to think that that's a command for us to behold this event. And behold, the heavens were open to him. Because remember, this wasn't said by John. It wasn't said to John. It wasn't said to anybody. It's actually just said to the reader. So the reader is really commanded, you and I, as we're reading this, behold, the heavens were opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove alighting upon him. And, and to me, I find that encouraging, enriching, enlightening, intriguing, that we as the reader are commanded to do something right here, and that is to witness the Holy Spirit descending on the beloved Son of God. The Spirit of God descended. So John chapter 1, verse 32 through 35, is really John indicating that this was one of the messages he was given to recognize God's Son. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending upon him from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with what is said to me, upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 2. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And behold, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, again, same thing, commanded, behold, a voice came from heaven and said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. You see, the reader of this book is commanded to pay attention to the Trinity right here. Behold, the Spirit of God alighting upon the Son of God. Behold, heaven's opening and God proclaiming, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. The Almighty God proudly, proudly and publicly proclaims Jesus as his beloved Son. So, in closing, there's a few things that I would like us to consider about this passage, this chapter as a whole. First of all, note the contrast between the Pharisees and Jesus. The Pharisees were convinced that they did not need to be baptized and didn't go there to be baptized. They were there to see what was going on. But they were the ones who most needed to be baptized. Jesus Christ did not need to be baptized. He did not need to be there and he knew everything that was going on. And yet he went there to be baptized, to fulfill all righteousness, to submit himself to the will of his Father. Consider the meaning of the Old Testament and the New Testament. John, the last prophet under the law, and Jesus Christ, the new Savior under the new covenant, the covenant of mercy. Consider the fact that Mary brought the Lord to the people in Matthew chapter 1, 
And in Matthew chapter 3, we see John bringing the people to the Lord. Consider the fact that John was the perfect Nazarite, but Jesus was the perfect and eternal high priest and person. I hope that you, I thought I had one more point there, sorry, but consider those few points for just a moment and let's close together in a word of prayer. Holy Father and mighty God, we love you with all our heart and soul and mind and strength and we truly behold your Son, Father, and I pray that you help us as much as we are able to in our small-mindedness to comprehend and to truly behold the Son of God, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and our High Priest, to behold the Holy Spirit that we have through him, our Counselor and our Comforter and our Seal unto salvation. Father, we thank you for your kingdom that has come in the name of Jesus and that we can be here together tonight to behold your Son through your words of truth. Thank you, Father, for this wonderful, treasured, and eternal record of how your Son became a part of his very own creation because of your incredible love for us. I pray that this be an encouragement for us and a learning for us as we consider the wonderful testament that we are under by your mercy and by your grace. I pray all these things now, Father, in the name of Jesus, our Savior. I pray that we shine this light and your light and your truth at every opportunity. Amen.